our speaker is uh, Dr. Aaron Worsing, and uh, I'm going to embarrass Aaron a little bit by saying that he's probably one of the best lecturers I've ever heard. So you guys are in for a, a treat tonight. I'm sorry, I really put the pressure on you, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> I think you can handle it. Uh, Aaron is uh, a faculty member in the wildlife science program uh, where I came from uh, in my career. Uh, he received an undergraduate degree in Bowdoin College in Maine, then he got a master's degree at the University of Idaho and a PhD at Simon Fraser. Uh, his major emphasis in his research is on predator ecology, and that's uh, the subject of tonight's talk, uh, which the title is Ecological Effects of Recolonizing Wolves in Washington. Now, I can't think of too many topics that would be more interesting to people than this one. So, Aaron, I'm really setting the stage for you, so I'll turn the program over to you. All right. Well, thanks so much for that introduction, Dave, and for putting the pressure on me. <laughs> uh, and I want to thank all of you uh, as members of the Flathead Audubon Society for inviting me to give this talk this evening. It's my distinct pleasure. Um, I also want to say I have a talk prepared and then I'm happy to address as many questions as you want afterwards. But as I'm going through the talk, if you want to chime in at any time by hitting the hand raise function or just speaking out or putting something in the chat, I'm also happy to stop and address those questions and go on any tangents that you like. So chime in at any time. And let's see if I can share. Oh, there we go. Okay, get everything aligned. I can see you. Can everybody see that okay? Yes. And hear me okay. Folks yes. generally don't have a hard time hearing me. <laughs> <laughs> the students in the front row of my classes often have to wear ear protection. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, as Dave mentioned, um, I'm, in the, I'm a professor of wildlife science at UW, and I'm also the principal investigator of the Predator Ecology Lab, where we explore a variety of questions pertaining to uh, large predator ecology and conservation, interestingly, both in the terrestrial and marine realm. So I'm going to focus on wolves today, uh, but just to give you a sense of the, the breadth of projects that uh, my students and I explore, I've also worked with everything from tiger and bull sharks uh, and alligators to brown bears and snow leopards. And as Dave mentioned, uh, wolves are always a topical, controversial issue, always fun to talk about. And I've, I'm sure that you've been privy to lots of stories about wolves, the implications of wolves, both ecologically and economically, ever since they were reintroduced to central Idaho uh, and Yellowstone in 95 and 96. I'm going to give you a slightly different spin on the story today that's sort of reflective of my uh, particular interest as a researcher, and that is in something called the ecology of fear, or the capacity of predators to influence their prey and entire ecosystems, not by killing things, but merely by being a threat and eliciting defensive behavior. Uh, and the, the theme today is that wolves can elicit strong defensive behavior in their prey, but different prey species can respond in very different ways. And that last thing is something that's not been very well appreciated. Um, and so, if nothing else, I hope you come away with an increased appreciation for the diversity of ways that wolves can impact prey populations merely by being a threat. And those prey shifts have major implications for plants, uh, but also for human interactions with wolf prey species like deer. And I'll, I'll uh, give some examples of that at the very end of the talk. So again, any questions, please chime in at any time. There we go. So let's start the talk. I want to set the stage by talking a little bit about the way that wolves hunt their prey. And then we'll keep that in mind as we move forward in the talk. So as indicated by this picture, which was taken by Dan McNulty uh, in Yellowstone as part of the Yellowstone Wolf Project, uh, this picture, of course, depicting a pack of wolves pursuing uh, an elk. 
Wolves are social pursuit predators. They form packs, uh, and these packs run down prey. And bringing down prey as a wolf is a pretty dangerous business. It's pretty easy to catch a hoof from a prey animal that's much larger than they are, like an elk or a moose or a bison. And thus, they rely upon sustained pursuits, both to wear prey out and to identify vulnerable individuals, individuals that might be a little bit younger, perhaps a little bit older, injured, sick, or malnourished, something like that. Uh, and once they identify those individuals, they tend to select them from groups of prey because those prey individuals are a little bit less likely to put up a fight and will be easier to bring down. Wolves also, and this is very germane to our talk today, uh, take advantage of terrain to facilitate being able to pursue prey for long distances. Uh, and so they tend to launch uh, attacks and chases uh, across relatively gentle terrain, flat areas, valley bottoms, along rivers, places like that where they can pursue prey for a long enough time to identify those weaknesses that I was just talking about. Uh, and just to underscore how long these chases can go, and we know this from, from the groundbreaking research in Yellowstone, some wolf chases have gone for up to 10 kilometers, so about six miles. So they, they can go a long way. That's what it takes sometimes to wear prey out or identify vulnerable individuals. And so if we flip it around and think from the prey's perspective, right, if you want to have the best chance of uh, getting away from wolves if you're attacked as a prey animal, then you want to select for landscape features that either make it harder for wolves to find you, or once wolves do find you, harder for wolves to chase you, right? So you want to be, so depending upon what kind of prey species you are, you might be selecting for dense forest cover where wolves are less likely to find you, or for steeper, more rugged, broken terrain where long chases are difficult. And that might discourage wolves from launching the attack in the first place. So please keep these ideas in mind as we address how different prey species respond to this new threat of wolves in the landscape in Washington as we move forward in this talk. But before I get to the, the study that uh, my students and I engaged in starting in 2012, I want to also just give a little bit of background on the conservation status of wolves in the lower 48 states and their ongoing expansion in the American West. So this map here, very roughly admittedly, but depicts the relationship between the historical range of gray wolves, basically almost all of the Western United States, central and Western United States, compared to where wolves are found now in red. Uh, and of course, the, the red part of the range, the contemporary range, is actually a little bit greater than depicted here. We know that there are wolf packs in South Central Oregon, as well as even a few in Northern California now. But you get the gist from this map. And the thing to say uh, is that relative to that historic range, where again, wolves occupied about two thirds of the lower 48, uh, and estimates were there may have been some, uh, at least a few hundred thousand of them, uh, after a systematic uh, campaign of persecution by the U.S. government, by the 1920s and 30s, wolves had been virtually extirpated from the entire lower 48, existing only as a small rendant population in the Great Lakes region. Several decades later, attitudes toward wolves had changed, although, of course, they remain controversial to this day, leading the government and a number of NGOs and groups to get together to begin repatriating wolves to parts of their former range, notably again, central Idaho and the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And that reintroduction has been quite a success leading to increases in, in wolf numbers and a range expansion into much of uh, Western Montana, throughout Idaho and now into Washington, Oregon and even California. Uh, and this recolonization event by gray wolves, in addition to being a conservation success, sets up all kinds of really interesting uh, scientific questions about what it means for these areas of the American West, in my case, the Pacific Northwest, to have, wolf, have wolves back after an absence of about a century. Uh, and so I assume my position at the University of Washington in 2008, coincidentally, the first breeding wolf pack, the lookout pack, was documented to have recolonized Washington in that same year. And I knew at that very moment being a predator prey ecologist, that I had to jump into the wolf game 
and start trying to assess what it meant for prey populations and ecosystems to have wolves back in Washington. And so I immediately began writing some grants uh, and was lucky enough to be funded by the National Science Foundation to begin a long-term study of wolf prey interactions in North Central and Northeastern Washington that continues to this day, started in 2011. And that sets the stage for, for my role in, in exploring wolf impacts in Washington. So at present, uh, wolves are recolonizing Washington. But as you can see from this map, this is one in a series of nice maps that's produced by the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, where the blue polygons represent pack territories or home ranges. Um, and WDFW updates these maps on an annual basis to give the public a good idea of sort of where the wolves are based upon the latest radio telemetry data. And what you can see is that we currently have about 20 wolf packs and I think about 120 or 130 wolves in the state of Washington. But importantly, they're distributed heterogeneously. The northeastern quadrant of the state is fairly saturated with wolves and that's not too surprising because the northeast part of Washington state is the point of entry from much, for much larger numbers of wolves in Idaho. And we also have some wolves coming down from southern BC, but wolves are gradually pushing westward and it's forecast that in about five years, there may be wolf packs all the way to the southwestern coastline and down by the, in the St. Helens region. So they are pushing throughout large areas of the state. Um, but importantly, from a scientific perspective, the heterogeneous or patchy distribution of wolves right now offers scientists like myself the opportunity to conduct natural or pseudo experiments comparing areas that are very close to each other, but differ really only in having or not having wolves to ask questions about the changes that happen across the landscape into prey populations as a function of wolf presence. And so in, let's see, there we go, sorry about that. Um, so in 2012, um, when I initiated my study, we identified an area uh, in Northeastern Washington known as the Okanagan Highlands where wolves had occupied part of the landscape, but that also offered some open uncolonized territories that could be compared to the areas that where wolves have been reestablished. And so you can see here within the red box, uh, our study focused on two, the effects of two wolf packs in particular, the strawberry pack, which was named after Strawberry Mountain uh, on the Colville Reservation, as well as the Nsitsin pack. Nsitsin is, uh, I think, Salish for wolf. And then there's, if you can see my cursor, an open area, um, where that, that had not yet been colonized by wolves, where we could sort of set up control areas, comparison areas, similar to the areas used by the wolf packs, but as of yet lacking wolves. This is what the landscape looks like. Um, it's somewhat reminiscent of, the, of parts of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, a little bit more forested, but it still offers a landscape where you have valley bottoms that you can see here that would be hunted by wolves, interdigitated with more mountainous landscapes, uh, offering the kind of broken terrain that might give ungulates like deer and elk more of an escape advantage against wolves. It's really a uh, sparsely populated region, uh, pretty good wolf habitat overall. And so not surprisingly, this area of the Okanagan Highlands has been colonized by several wolf packs. And again, we focused on the strawberry and in seats and packs. Um, here's a, a zoom in of the four study areas that we established. So you can see we established study areas that basically coincided with the territory sizes of the strawberry and in seats and wolf pack, wolf packs uh, here highlighted in blue. And then we paired those with two control sort of wolf free or at least areas that were only very lightly used by wolves um, allowing us to sort of contrast the behavior of prey species in areas with and without the threat of wolf predation. And that leads me to another reason why, why we chose this area. So you can see here's the, the border with Canada. Uh, here's the Colville Reservation. Above it is an area called the North Half, which is co-managed by the Forest Service and the Confederated Tribes of the Colville. Um, 
And one of the reasons that we selected this particular area, in addition to the nice juxtaposition of sort of wolf occupied and wolf free areas, is that this is a special place in Washington, which is occupied sympatrically by two different deer species, mule deer and white-tailed deer. Typically throughout the American West, although the, the West is used by both of these deer species, it's hard to find them in the same place. But here in the Okanagan Highlands, they overlap spatially with one another. And that enabled us to ask questions about whether they responded the same way or differently to wolves in areas that they both occupy. So we could actually very directly compare the anti-wolf or anti-predator behavior of these two deer species. And this was a really rare opportunity to do so. If you move farther west in Washington, you get only mule deer. And if you move farther east in Washington, you get predominantly white-tailed deer. This was the sweet Goldilocks spot right in the middle where we had both. So here's our wolf packs absent, two wolf areas compared with two non-wolf areas. So here are two deer species. I, I'm sure you're familiar with both. They're both pervasive <laughs> throughout the American West, but that's what makes this so interesting because morphologically, they're very similar. They can be pretty hard to tell apart, right? Aside from the very diagnostic feature of mule deer tails looking like they've been dipped in ink, can be pretty darn hard to tell them apart. They have similar body sizes. Mule deer are a little bit stockier and more robust. Um, they, they have a slightly different diet, but there's a lot of dietary overlap. Uh, mule deer have a little bit more of a preference for sort of upland, sloped, steeper terrain, whereas white-tailed deer tend to be found a little bit more in dense forest cover and in lowland valley bottoms. But again, there's spatial overlap as well. But they differ markedly in one dimension that, that kind of harkens back to what I talked about earlier in terms of how wolves hunt. That is, these two deer species run differently. And you've probably noticed this if you've ever spooked mule deer or white-tailed deer. Let me show you what I mean. So white-tailed deer on the top are gallopers, just like horses and elk. Uh, so they're very fleet of foot. They have a smooth gallop that can generate very high rates of speed, but on flat ground, right? It, the ground needs to be nice and gentle and flat to have a nice gallop to sustain high levels of speed. Uh, and so white-tailed deer tend to seek smooth ground that facilitates basically rapid escape from predators. They seek to outrun predators. So they're relatively happy even to have predators chase them, provided that they're in an area where they can easily get away. By contrast, mule deer on the bottom, although they can gallop, they have an awkward gallop. And that actually has to do with their musculature and skeletal morphology. They have a, sort of a, a hitch in their gallop, if you will, that prevents them from going really fast with it. Instead, when they're confronted with predation, they engage in a bounding or bouncing running gait that's called stotting, which you can see here, where all four, if you can see the cursor here of their legs, hit the ground very close together at the same time. It's almost as if they're on a pogo stick. It's not very fast, but it's very effective for navigating around ob obstacles like boulders or coarse woody debris, branches on the ground, cr uh, ravines, crevasses, things like that. So wherever the terrain is broken up and steep and uneven, stotting can be a very effective way of moving across the landscape. Quite effective, uh, in fact, against coursing predators like wolves, pursuit predators like wolves that might be trying to chase them down. So we thought going in that these different running gates of these two deer species might shape the way that they spatially respond to the threat of wolves, specifically by inducing these two deer species to move in opposite directions across the landscape with white-tailed deer seeking flat ground that facilitates their galloping, speed-oriented means of getting away from predators, and mule deer perhaps pushing upslope to more broken terrain, facilitating their sort of agility-based stotting means or bounding means of getting away from predators. So if we look at that sort of by means of a flow chart, then in the areas that had been colonized by wolves in comparison to the wolf-free areas, we anticipated that mule deer, which, with, which stot, might increase their use of various landscape features, right? That basically benefit their agility. 
okay, or facilitate their agility or where they'd have an agility advantage over wolves, if you will. So we predicted they might increase their use of sloped, rugged and roadless terrain with obstacles, giving them a better chance of escape by stalking. The reason we had roadless in there is there's a lot of research on wolves showing that wolves actually use linear features like roads and trails, not major roads, but smaller roads and trails as a means of not only effectively searching the landscape for prey, but pursuing prey because a road is nice and flat, great for running prey down. Right? So if you're an animal like a mule deer that relies on rope and train and agility, we anticipated they might not like being near roads either. By contrast, we predicted that white-tailed deer, which flee by galloping, when exposed to wolves relative to the wolf-free control areas, might increase their use of flat open terrain, giving them a better chance of escaping wolves by sprinting away. So with those predictions in mind, in, in 2012, over several winters, we began systematically trapping uh, both deer species over the winter with the purpose of equipping them with global positioning system or GPS collars that were mortality sensitive. So first on the left, you can see the traps we use. These were baited clover or collapsible traps. They're really pretty nifty um, because you put them out in winter and you flavor them with some things that deer really like to eat, maybe a combination of alfalfa, apples, and molasses. And the deer are pretty food stressed in the winter because, of course, the landscape is covered by snow, incentivizing them to go in the trap. Once they go in there, they hit a trigger mechanism that closes the trap and also would trip a little receiver, a little transmitter for us that would send our crew the signal that we had somebody in the trap so we could race out there uh, and quickly process the deer so they didn't have to spend very long in the trap. And clover traps are really nice because they have these soft net perimeters. And so as you approach the closed the close trap, all you have to do is pull a few knots and the whole thing collapses flat, which basically pins the deer inside a net, meaning you can work them up in about 15 minutes, equipping them with a radio collar like the one you see here without having to use any immobilizing drugs. And then you release them uh, and they're in really good shape. When we had deer captured in this manner, we equipped them again with GPS collars like this one, which would stay on the deer for up to three years of their life, giving us uh, several locations per day and a very detailed layout of how they use the landscape. And these collars were also importantly mortality sensitive, meaning that if anything killed the deer, we'd get a different kind of signal through the satellite network that would enable us to go in and retrieve the collar and figure out what killed the deer. And that was, although not the focus of this talk, that enabled us to assess how often wolves actually depredated or killed and ate uh, members of the two deer species. This is just a picture of uh, a deer that we had in the trap, then quickly tied up for deployment of uh, one of the radio collars, and then released. The whole thing again took about 15 minutes, uh, really pretty easy on the deer. So, as far as results are concerned, I, I just want to. Um, preface things by saying that one of the, the really enjoyable aspects of this project is that we got to work very closely with the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Fish and Wildlife Department, who colored the wolves in the two wolf packs where of that, we had detailed GPS data on the members of the two wolf packs as well, enabling us to assess how they use the landscape to test our assumptions about where the wolves spent their time hunting. Uh, and I can point out to you here that wolves behaved as you might expect wolves to behave. So these are uh, amounts of use of the, the, the two I want you to pay attention to are roads and slope on the left. Um, the open circles are amounts of use by wolves and the dark circles are what's available on the landscape. So this first one here is distance to road. So relative to the average distance of each pixel on the landscape to a road, wolves were closer than what was available. So in other words, they, they spent most of their time closer to roads than what that landscape offered on average. That was a significant difference. Again, consistent with other research showing that wolves like to use roads as travel corridors, as well as to pursue prey. Even more dramatically, relative to what was available on the landscape in terms of slope, 
wolves selected for very low, gentle slopes. In other words, they selected for the flat country in our study area, which is consistent with what we know about the way wolves hunt, right? Flat ground facilitates their ability to run down prey over long distances. So wolves did what we expected them to do. And the next question became, did deer behave as we expected them to? The answer is a qualified yes, but interestingly, at different spatial scales. So there was an additional spatial scale wrinkle that I'll walk you through now. Okay, and the way to summarize it is both deer species did respond to wolves and they responded in the ways that we predicted them to, but mule deer responded by relocating their entire home ranges. Basically, they moved on the order of kilometers. They got out of Dodge when they were exposed to wolves, whereas white-tailed deer didn't go anywhere. They actually stayed in place. They stayed within their pre-existing home ranges but made fine scale adjustments within their home ranges in terms of what resources they use when exposed to wolves. So let's unpack that for just a minute. Let's talk about mule deer first. This first figure here is probability of use of areas of varying distance to roads in the non-wolf areas, open triangles, and wolf areas in red, okay? So what you can see here especially this is increasing distance to roads. So low values mean close to roads. And as you can see here, relative to the wolf free areas, there was a huge drop among mule deer in areas close to roads in the wolf areas. So response number one, when, when mule deer relocated their entire home ranges, they chose new home ranges that were far from roads. They just avoided roads altogether. They also moved up slope. So again, relative to the open triangle, you can see not probability of use didn't change much relative to slope in the non-wolf areas, but in the red wolf areas, right? Um, mule deer had very low probability of using gentle slopes and a very, very high probability, a, a greatly elevated probability of using steep slopes, the broken terrain that suits their starting bounding escape tactics. So another big response when mule deer repositioned their home ranges, they placed their new home ranges up slope, up on the mountaintops far from wolves down in the valley bottoms and where if they were to encounter a wolf, they'd have the best possible chance of getting away. Interestingly, mule deer in the wolf areas also moved into forest cover. So you can see, so this is increasing amounts of forest cover on the x-axis. Not much difference in probability of use across that spectrum in the wolf-free areas, but if you put wolves on the landscape, mule deer exhibited very low use of open environments and they pushed much more into forest cover. So not only did they reposition their home ranges to be far from roads and up on the mountaintops, but also into forest cover where they'd be less likely to be found by wolves. So the conclusion is mule deer were quite affected by the presence of wolves and relocated long distances across the landscape in a way that made them both less likely to encounter wolves and more likely to escape if they did happen to bump into a wolf. Very different story for white-tailed deer. You can see here, these are fine scale within home range changes at the 30 by 30 meter scale. And you can see it's very different. So in the wolf areas relative to the wolf free areas, white-tailed deer made fine scale adjustments within their home ranges to actually be closer to roads. They pushed a little bit closer to roads, which seems counterintuitive because that's pushing them closer to wolves. But remember, roads are nice flat ground for galloping. White-tailed deer also increased their use of low slopes of gentle flat terrain in the presence of wolves, right? So that even without wolves, you can see here, they always had a tendency of using low slopes, higher probability of use of the lowest slopes. So this is increasing slope on the x-axis. But that tendency was significantly magnified in the presence of wolves. They really within their home range is pushed to the flattest, gentlest areas possible, again, presumably to facilitate their ability to flee. Oops, and um, uh, the last interesting thing here is 
So this is increasing cover. So down here, close to zero, these are low cover areas. And you can see in the presence of wolves, white-tailed deer increased within their home ranges use of low forest cover areas. In other words, open country. They actually moved out of the forest where they'd be more likely to be found by wolves, presumably again, because moving out of the forest enhanced their ability to run fast. So radically divergent responses by mule deer and white-tailed deer. So wrapping up, despite overall morphological similarity, right? These two deer species look an awful lot alike. They eat a lot of the same kind of things. They're found, broadly speaking, in the same kinds of areas. But mule and white-tailed deer, at least where we worked in North Central Washington, responded very differently to the presence of wolves. Mule deer shifted broadly. They moved their entire home ranges to upland areas with rugged terrain and heavy forest cover to facilitate both avoidance of wolves by hiding in the trees and escape from wolves if they needed an agility advantage. Conversely, white-tailed deer manage risk more locally, if you will, within their home range. They were less intimidated by wolves. They largely stayed put. And in fact, they adjusted their fine scale space use within their home range to use more of features that wolves target for hunting, like roads and flat terrain. They actually pushed toward wolves. And that's, that's such an interesting response, but we're learning that this often happens. Basically, if you're a prey animal that's really good at escaping a predator, you don't need to avoid that predator. You can actually co-occur with that predator because you have the assurance of being able to escape. And that seems to be what white-tailed deer are, are able to do by contrast, mule deer, which would be terrible at escaping wolves on flat ground because they're not fast runners, have to radically adjust their spatial use in multiple ways to assure that they don't fall prey to wolves. What this means from a conceptual standpoint is that if you know the lay of the land and you know the hunting mode of the predator, in our case that wolves are pack hunting pursuit predators, right? And you know how that pursuit predator uses the landscape. You can combine that information with an understanding of the escape tactic, in this case, the running gate of the prey to predict fairly reliably what the prey is gonna do when they're confronted with the risk from that predator, right? We leverage differences in running gates of mule, mule deer and white tail deer to anticipate how they might redistribute it across the landscape. And that's exactly what they did. And I think this is a broadly applicable approach as we try to forecast how prey are responding to recolonizing predators all around the world. And that's a really important thing to do because of, as a result of a combination of protections from humans as well as climate change, although predators are in decline in many areas, we're seeing many other areas where their numbers are recovering and their ranges are expanding. So from a conservation and management perspective, we need to be able to anticipate how prey are going to respond if we're going to be able to forecast what kind of ecosystem changes are going to accompany these predator uh, recolonization events. Another interesting possibility, given that these two deer species are voracious herbivores, is that by redistributing where deer are on the landscape, wolves could indirectly be in influencing plant communities and forest features. We're looking into this right now. I don't have the results just yet. I have a grad student on it. But our hypothesis is this. If gray wolves induce mule deer upslope, right, then they may shift the signature of mule deer herbivory upslope, right? And that means plants that mule deer like to eat, like bitter brush pictured here in upland terrain, might experience increased herbivory impacts once the area is recolonized by wolves. And by contrast, plants mule deer like to eat in the low country might get a break. And you might see the opposite with white-tailed deer, right? If they increase their use of flat terrain, their herbivory might be shifted to plants they like to eat, like willow, in the flattest parts of their home range, right? So one interesting possibility here is not only that wolves just in general might indirectly influence plants by shaping deer behavior, but that they might indirectly influence plants via multiple pathways, one mule deer pathway and a very different white-tailed deer pathway, adding to the complexity of the effects that wolves have on their ecosystems. One way of visualizing this more broadly 
uh, is by looking at what happens on the landscape, right? So if when we, in our study area at least, in this interesting area of overlap or sympatry between mule deer and white-tailed deer, in the absence of wolves, they both generally occupy the low country, okay? And that means they're both feeding on plant species in the low country, right? With white-tailed deer maybe targeting things like willow a bit more and mule deer targeting things like service berry and, and bitter brush a little bit more, although again, there's dietary overlap. When you put wolves on the landscape, white-tailed deer largely stay in place, but mule deer are pushed up slope, right? And so that's potentially pushing the signature of their herbivory to a different part of the landscape, to plants that previously would have been relatively free of herbivory. And that could have implications for, again, plant community structure. It might also have implications for humans in, in so far as their interrelationships with deer. You know, one thing that occurred to us, one implication that, that I'm happy to discuss is that mule, whoops, mule deer, which I think are a bit more of a favored game species for people in Washington relative to white-tailed deer, mule deer pushing up slope could alter their availability to hunters. Um, and so this, this is a, an additional very interesting dimension, economic dimension and recreational dimension of the presence of wolves is that they may actually make mule deer in some areas less available to people, while at the same time, if they push white-tailed deer closer to ro roads, they might be making white-tailed deer more available, right? So there are complicated, very interesting human dimensions of the impacts of wolves as well. And one final thing I'll say about that is, one of the, the biggest influences of deer on people is vehicle collisions, right? And so these results might have implications there as well, right? If you're pushing mule deer away from roads, you're diminishing the collision risk. But if wolves push white-tailed deer closer to roads, they could be enhancing the collision risk. And that's, that's a topic that's garnered a fair bit of discussion of late, is what would the effects of repatriating predators be on deer vehicle collision risk? And this study indicates that the, the answer to that is complicated and, and prey species specific. I'll leave it at that because uh, I want to leave time for questions. And hopefully we've got, let's see how to do. Oh yeah. Um, but before I close, I just want to acknowledge the three grad students of mine who did all the field work and spearheaded these efforts. Justin Dellinger, who did the, the deer radio collaring, Carolyn Shores, who ran a simultaneous uh, camera trapping study where we could assess predator-prey interactions with photographs and no trapping. Uh, and April Craig, who's doing the plant exposure work that I mentioned near the end. I also wanna uh, emphasize through all the, the logos here, all the financial institutions who played a major role in funding this work. And I wanna give a special call out again to the Fish and Wildlife Department of the uh, Confederated Tribes of the Colville uh, for not only providing logistical support, but uh, giving us permission to work on their lands and being really great research partners. All right. Oops. With that, I've got the, this is a camera trap photo. It's the same one behind me. I call this essence of wolf. I love how the wolf is looking right at the camera trap. And this was taken by a, a camera deployed by my PhD student, Justin Dellinger. <laughs> I think that leaves us with time for some questions. Thanks, everybody. Very good. Thanks, Aaron. That was great. I, I aimed for 30 minutes. I think I got I went about 35. That's okay. I think we did just <laughs> fine. <laughs> did you guys, yeah. Hey Aaron, have you guys done any um studies or seen any other effects of some of the other predators? Uh, you know, like mountain lions and coyotes and that sort of thing? And what, what did you find? Yeah, great, great question. So yeah, I didn't have time to get into all the other dimensions. So I mentioned, first of all, that the radio collars we put on the deer, we ended up, you know, one thing I forgot to mention should have is we collared about 120 deer, 60 of each species. So a fairly large sample of, of the two deer species in the study area. And I mentioned that not only because it gave us a really good picture of how they use the landscape, but it also allowed us to do a survival analysis. This is germane to your question. Um, over uh, the course of three years, we were able to sort of systematically quantify how often the deer died and what killed them. 
And that we found that mortality was caused by a variety of predators, as well as other causes like vehicle collisions, even accidents. We had a few, one or two mule deer that plummeted to their death from steep areas. Which is, so that, that's a natural hazard of using those, those steep slopes as well. But one thing to emphasize is we found that coyotes and mountain lions actually inflicted more mortality than wolves did. We only had two deer, two white-tailed deer, killed by wolves over the course of our study. That's partly, again, a reflection of the fact that wolves aren't that numerous in the landscape. And of course, the other predators were in all four study areas, right? Whereas wolves were only in two. So they were at a little bit of a disadvantage, but it still underscores uh, the limited, what we call consumptive or direct predatory effects of wolves. They're just, they don't seem to be killing that many deer on the landscape yet, at least. Mountain lions were the number one predator of deer, which again makes sense because they're very numerous on the landscape. And the second thing I'd say about that is that my second grad student, Carolyn Shores, who did the camera trapping study, the really nice thing about that study is it didn't have to be limited to just wolves and deer. We photographed everybody from moose and elk and bears, coyotes, bobcats, uh, you know, of course, wolves, both deer species. And so she was able to ask a similar set of questions, but incorporating some of the other predators. And so she did some studies that both corroborated what we found using the GPS radio telemetry data. The camera data also showed mule deer and white-tailed deer responding divergently in terms of what part of the day they use and what part of the landscape they use based on camera detections. But it allowed us to incorporate mountain lions, the other top predator of the system. And one thing that's really interesting is neither deer species seem to respond very strongly to mountain lions. Maybe it's because they were in all four study areas. I'm certain they have had effects, but based upon what we were looking at, those landscape scale shifts, um, we didn't see anything that would be indicative in the camera data. And, and I say that because each camera was associated with a wolf detection rate and a mountain lion detection rate. And we found strong deer responses, basically avoidance of cameras where wolves were detected a lot, but not so much mountain lions. So for whatever reason, they didn't exert as strong an effect as wolves, but all the predators are out there killing deer. Uh, and I'm sure they have some impact behaviorally as well. But what's interesting about the system is that maybe because they're a new predator back on the landscape and were only found in two of the four sites, the big behavioral responses were to wolves. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and then also, did you see any, or could you extrapolate any sort of effects of like less mountain lions or less coyotes with the reintroduction of wolves? Or was, is that kind of something that would be too hard to figure out? Oh, another great question. Yeah, we didn't have the data to assess coyote and mountain lion abundance, unfortunately, because we can photograph them and get a sense of relative use, but we couldn't individually distinguish them for population estimation. But uh, one of Carolyn's dissertation chapters was on how mountain lions respond to wolves, which are a threat, and humans, which are a threat, because mountain lions are, are hunted uh, in this system. And one thing that was really interesting there is the cameras timestamp all the photos. So you can tell not just where animals are, but what part of the day they use. And we have mountain lions everywhere. So we could basically ask uh, relative to the areas with or, or in the areas with wolves, did mountain lions do anything differently? Okay. And what we found is that in the areas with wolves, despite human hunting, mountain lions became more diurnal. So it seems like cougars were actually avoiding the nocturnal hunting periods of wolves choosing to be a little bit more day active, which is interesting because that puts them at greater risk of bumping into people. And again, for, for much of the year, year they're hunted. So this was some interesting evidence that they may be choosing people over wolves, at least in this system. So yeah, we're, we're still sort of unpacking it all, but there are myriad connections within these ecosystems that we've been exploring. Uh, Carolyn did a, a bunch of interesting things. She also showed that, um, Small, she was able to assess smaller predators. So coyotes and bobcats, basically, they also changed the part of the day they used based upon the presence of wolves. 
and coyotes responded more strongly because wolves don't like coyotes. So as you expect, where wolves are prevalent, coyotes kind of got out of there, but that was nice because that opened up space for bobcats. Otherwise, coyotes are dominant, are dominant over bobcats. So there's a whole cascade of carnivore interactions apparently triggered by the presence of wolves. Really interesting. Yeah, super interesting. I see a hand up, Diane. Yeah, fascinating presentation, Aaron. Thank you so much. Oh, and it's welcome. nice. It's nice to know in in your multi predator, multi prey system, like it's been shown in Montana and Idaho and now Washington, that where all these species coexist, mule deer, well deer, that lions are the biggest predators on the deer, it's not wolves, which is a kind of a surprise. But my question to you is. Since you could detect the movements of the mule deer moving uphill, which is very interesting, did you find that made them more susceptible, increased their predation to lions? Because lions live up in the rocky terrain up high, avoiding, I don't know, did you find that at all? I, I love that question. That is our hypothesis. Okay. You know, we haven't been able to assess it um, because we, yeah, we just, our focus was, was more on those non consumptive behavioral interactions. But yeah, in, in the papers we wrote, we hypothesized that one thing wolves might be doing to mule deer is basically pushing them into the mountain lion's wheelhouse. So that, that would be the, the anticipated response. The problem for these deer is that they're sort of pinched between these two predators because the predators hunt very different parts of the landscape, right? It's, it's, what do you want? The frying pan or the fire, right? The wolves hunt the open country down low and the, the cougars, are in the forest and upslope more predominantly where they can take advantage of terrain to stalk their prey. And so, yeah, I mean, the, the shift of mule deer would seem into the forest and upslope would put them right next to mountain lions. So that would certainly be my guess. Go, and that, that would be a, a really great follow-up question to assess. Another interesting thing, Carolyn found some research to suggest that depending upon what landscape you're talking about, actually moving upslope in forested environments can actually make deer easier to shoot by hunters because the sight line upslope is more direct and not obstructed by vegetation. So one interesting question to ask is, by pushing upslope, are mule deer more or less vulnerable to humans? I don't know the answer to that question, but you could go either way. They're farther, because of course humans tend to be restricted to the roads not exclusively, but tend to be, but the sight line might be better. So there are just so many additional interesting questions to ask here. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, oh yeah, let, can, do you mind if I get one to one in the chat here? It's been sitting here for a second, then I'll get to you. Okay. Yeah. One in the, in the chat was, do elk behave more like mule deer or whitetail in relation to habitat selection? And moose. Oh, well, we don't know in our system because we neither deployed GPS collars on those ungulates, nor had enough camera detections to robustly analyze it. The nice thing about the deer is, again, we collared 120 of them and we had tens of thousands of camera detections. <laughs> so we were able to very, very robustly assess their responses. What I would say from what I know in other systems is that moose don't respond very strongly to wolves at all. And it's because they have a stand and fight tactic. They're very well able to defend themselves and seem much less concerned. That's not to say wolves can't kill them. They can, especially if they're malnourished or parasitized or it's really deep snow. But generally speaking, moose have a, a very dampened response to wolves because a healthy moose is gonna be pretty well able to defend itself. Elk are somewhere in between uh, mule deer and whitetail deer in that they gallop like whitetail deer and they're fast and they are able to get away but they've also been shown to push a little bit upslope and into cover to uh, basically be less likely to encounter wolves and perhaps induce wolves to be a little bit less likely to give chase. So they seem to split the difference a little bit, which is interesting. They can certainly run and they can run for kilometers and kilometers, but unlike white-tailed deer, they will push up slope um, a, a little bit. We, we see that in, uh, in Yellowstone, for example. So yet a different approach, an intermediate approach. And then moose, no approach. Yeah, Aaron, I just want to make a quick comment. On that first class I took to Yellowstone in 1994, uh, I have some pictures, if I can find them, of hundreds of elk in the Lamar Valley. 
as you know, you go there now, there are no elk in the valley. <laughs> yeah. uh, since the wolves, I think, forced them up into the mountains. Right, yeah, excellent point. Yeah, in the absence of wolves, elk are down in the lowlands too, where a lot of the best um, foraging is to be had. So yes, no doubt. It's kind of a, I don't think they go quite as high as the mule deer do, but yet definitely pushing up slope. And it's remarkable. You're right. If you go to Yellowstone now, you just won't see, you, you'll see very few elk in Lamar Valley. And those elk you do see are hyper vigilant. It's pretty <laughs> amazing to watch how concerned they are. They have, they have to have their head on a swivel uh, <laughs> for wolves. So great point, Dave. Thanks for that. Absolutely. So yes, they're definitely more, seem to be more influenced by wolves spatially than white-tailed deer are. But again, I would emphasize that's Yellowstone and it's kind of hard to, to compare systems. What we really want to know is what elk did in my system and we really don't know. Uh, Joe, you had a question. Yeah. Um, did you see any evidence of wasting disease in, um, in your deer that would make them more, well, weaker and more susceptible to predation? Yeah, that, oh, great question. You know, we did not see any evidence, but I've been hearing word of more and more evidence accumulating. It's starting to arrive. So I wonder what we would see if we did the study again. And I agree with you. You'd certainly predict based upon the hunting methodology of wolves that they would vary, that they would target um, diseased animals in that manner. There's also, I think the elk population around Mount St. Helens region is plagued by, uh, was it hoof rot or something? And it would be very interesting to see when the wolves get in there, I suspect they'd target diseased individuals too. In fact, there's some really cool research in Europe to show that because wolves so consistently target vulnerable individuals that they actually can limit uh, amounts of disease transmission in prey populations. So wolves and other predators might actually be a tool to at least dampen the spread of things like CWD because they very rapidly remove those individuals in the population. This was a study of wild boar in Europe. Basically, uh, when subject to wolf predation, disease transmission dynamics were um, um, attenuated. It's a great question. Uh, let's see, I've got one in the, oh, uh, TC, did you want me to read or did you want to speak out your question? Looks like they're muted. Yeah. I will read it. I will read it out here. Can and then I have a question. <laughs> oh yeah? No, go ahead and read Tanya's question and then I'll ask my question. Oh, okay, okay. So the, the, the chat question is: did you explore seasonal effects? In other words, would you anticipate deer moving differently during winter than during summer? Excellent question. The answer is yes, we did. So we looked at different scales for both deer, like I described in the talk, the, home, the within the home range, range scale, as well as across the landscape scale, sort of repositioning home range. And we also looked at things seasonally, all four seasons. And uh, the, the results are, are complicated. So what, what I showed you was restricted to the winter, but we had different responses, complicated and different responses in the other seasons. So the, yes, there is very strong seasonal mediation of what goes, what goes on. So during some seasons, the responses were stronger. In other seasons, the responses were weaker. So in fact, yeah, the conclusion is the effect of wolves is not just prey specific, but also scale specific and seasonally specific. What wolves do in the winter to these deer, very different from what they do in the summer. In general, again, it, I could talk all day unpacking the seasonal effects and I'd probably have to dig up the manuscript, but the summary is the effects were much stronger in the winter, much weaker in the summer. And there's some good reasons for that, including that the deer are very well nourished in the summer and the snow does not pose a mobility problem. So it's sort of advantage deer in the summer and they can ignore the wolves a little bit. We see that in Yellowstone too. It's advantage wolves in the winter where the deer are bogged down in the snow and a bit more malnourished. Very good. Yeah, to be expected. Thank you. I guess there's another question yeah. here. So then I have a question. But you looked at you looked at two different species in four study areas. Did you see a difference in survivorship? I.e., was one were both methods successful in population survival, or was one better than the oh, other? Oh, such a good question. 
Yeah, that, okay, right. So did, did sort of comparing the relative strategies of the deer, were they both winners or was one a winner and one a loser? Hard to say, and, and you know, I love that question because it underscores something that I feel very strongly about in ecology, which is the value of long-term research. One of the reasons that the Yellowstone study has been so groundbreaking is they've been going for what? 20 plus years now. And the kinds of insights that would that, that question relates to only emerge after sort of 10, 15 years of data collection, right? When you have um, very robust sort of individual survival data and things like that that you can intersect with, with, with different responses. The short answer is we didn't work long enough in the system um, to collect enough mortality data to answer that question at the population level. Right? We, we were focused more at the in, what were individual deer doing. We don't know what those individual deer responses mean for sort of population demography. In other words, the excellent question would be, well, what are the implications for the mule deer population there as well as the white-tailed deer population? Alas, we don't yet know that. Um, I'm part of a different study where a grad student working with Professor Laura Prue at UW is addressing that kind of question. We couldn't really address it here. What I would say is that it would seem, based upon the question we had earlier from Diane, that if I were to pick a species that's losing, it's probably mule deer, in that they were forced to really compromise by one, abandoning the area which has the best food and two being pushed into the mountain lions territory which is a more abundant prolific predator in this system but that's just a a hypothesis for testing at this point but i, I love that question that's a, I, I wish i could keep working in this system for another decade <laughs> that uh, aaron um dave yeah. here uh, that kind of begs the question uh, are these uh, two ungulates adopting the original strategy they had when wolves were there? That is a great question. I would anticipate yes. I would anticipate yes. Yeah, would anticipate yes. And, and, and what that may mean is that the co-occurrence of mule deer and white-tailed deer in the system is an artifact of the wolves' absence. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, and it, what it underscores is that, you know, so much of our understanding of ecosystems all around the world is based upon studies in systems for which at least some predators were absent, right? So um, we're lacking sort of a comprehensive understanding of what prey animals would do in multi-predator landscapes. We see it in just a few areas like the Serengeti. The exciting thing about wolf recolonization of the West is we're uh, you know, building towards a more complete predator cohort, which then allows you to ask that question, what might these ecosystems have looked like with an intact predator assemblage? And yeah, I think mule deer would be adopting their historical strategy. Yeah. I wonder what whitetail deer did before roads. <laughs> and agricultural fields. <laughs> yeah, right. it's, you know, it's a tougher question with whitetail deer because one, they're experiencing a range expansion and they're greatly facilitated by people. So, I mean, humans are always playing a huge role in ecosystems, but particularly outsized when it comes to white-tailed deer. So harder to say what they would have done historically because they wouldn't have been found in as many places in Washington for one. Right. Oh, uh, I, I don't know. Do we have any more time? I don't want to hold people over here. I know we're at seven. I'm going to let Gail make the call, but she's muted oh, right now. Yeah, I'm muted. Um, I think we got time for one more. You pick it. <laughs> okay. Last question is, are there beavers in your study area? And if so, did you notice any change in beaver populations of wolves? Um, we did not detect beavers in our study area. I can't say they're not there, but at least where we were working, trapping the deer and putting the cameras out, uh, we didn't detect them, but I have no doubt they were once there and research elsewhere underscores the critically important role that beavers play in sort of mediating the indirect effects of wolves on plants, right? There's really cool emerging research in Yellowstone, for example, 
showing that the reason the plant response in Yellowstone to wolves has been patchy. There's been a big response in some areas as wolves, as Dave described, wolves sort of chase elk out. In other areas, the plant response has not been very dramatic, even though elk numbers and elk herbivory have been changed by wolves. And beavers seem to be the key to that difference because by damming waterways and changing the hydrology, raising the water temperature, they're basically raising accessibility of water to plants. And part of the, the complication in Yellowstone is that beavers were extirpated largely from the system coincident with wolves. And so areas where wolves are having a big effect now are areas that have been recolonized by beavers because they've raised the water enough that the plants have enough to drink to capitalize on this relaxation of elk herbivory. Whereas in areas that lack beavers, the streams tend to be deeply scoured, the water table is lower. Uh, and even though you have diminished levels of elk herbivory, the plants haven't responded because they're, they're too thirsty. So, and, and the broader pick, I was, it, I, I'm so glad you asked that question. I was discussing this with an undergrad in my office hours. And we were pointing out that historically in the US, beavers would have covered a, a vast swath of the lower 48 and would have engineered the environment to be like a vast wetland. Um, and so that question of sort of what the wolf-deer relationship and the wolf-deer plant relationship would have looked like has to include beavers as well. And we have sort of a distorted baseline because beavers are missing from so much of the landscape now. So if we're going to talk about intact predator assemblages and functional predator-prey plant relationships, the beaver has to be part of the discussion as well. Maybe that's a good place to leave that's, it. That's a great place to, to wrap up. And uh, I suppose people could write you. Uh, you probably have an email you could put in the chat box or something. It's I will happily do that. Yes. Yeah. Yes, please do. If anybody has follow up questions, I'm going to type two things in here. One is my email address. The other is my lab page. If anybody is interested in getting a sense of what my overall research program is about and profiles of my different grad students and lists of publications, I've put in the website of my research program. 